All right, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the webinar titled Understanding the Translational Value of PV Loops from Mouse to Man. My name is Nick Glover from Inside Scientific, and I'll be your host for today's event. Today's session is the sixth installment in our PV Loops to Measure Cardiac Function webinar series. We are happy to share that since beginning the program last year, over 680 scientists from all over the world have registered to participate in this web series. A warm welcome to those of you who are online today. Thank you for joining us. Our session today is sponsored by Millar and will be focused on the progression of PV loop science from bench to bedside. Today we are joined by Dr. Naveen Kapoor, Assistant Professor and Assistant Director of the Interventional Cardiology Center at Tufts University School of Medicine. While practicing as a medical doctor in the areas of internal medicine, cardiovascular disease, and interventional cardiology, Dr. Kapoor's research is primarily focused on molecular cardiac fibrosis and novel imaging modalities of myocardial perfusion. Sharing his work today on the topic of PV loops, Dr. Kapoor will focus on how PV loop data can translate from mouse to man and provide a confident approach of evaluating drug studies, device validation, and treatment outcomes. Good morning and thanks everybody for uh, joining this webinar discussion about uh, translational hemodynamics. Uh, the role of pressure volume loop analysis. Um, I'd like to first start by thanking Millar uh, for asking me to discuss this topic and to share our experience with PV catheters uh, from the basic science laboratory to the clinical setting. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Naveen Kapoor and I'm an interventional cardiologist and an advanced heart failure transplant specialist uh, whose clinical work focuses on the gamut of uh, heart disease and I have a research interest in uh, cardiac remodeling at the basic science level uh, up to mechanical circulatory support um, at the translational and clinical level. So for today's talk, I thought that we would um, basically uh, give a very brief overview of heart disease, put this in context. We'll talk very briefly about pressure and volume uh, physiology as it relates to cardiovascular function. There are some excellent webinars that have preceded this one which go into much more detail about the uh, physiology of, uh, of heart failure as well as um, the technical aspects of the conductance catheter method. But I will show you some of how we've been using the conductance catheter method um, in our laboratories. Then we're going to talk about preclinical applications uh, focused primarily on experimental biology in the basic science arena. Uh, and then translational applications with a focus on our large animal research laboratory uh, and mechanical pump uh, physiology. And then finally some clinical applications uh, really defining a new age for invasive hemodynamics. So I think we can all agree that heart disease is a true pandemic. This picture is designed to illustrate the fact that if you look at the causes of death around the world, heart disease is a dominant uh, cause of death. It's a major issue globally um, and is one that, that is really driving a lot of the technology um, towards targeting these patients who have heart disease. And if we look at heart disease as an American problem, it really comes front and center. It's the number one cause of death in the United States accounts for one in every four deaths, and it accounts for about 700, over 700,000 heart attacks per year, which is really um, a large number of patients who are coming in with new onset uh, heart injury. And this, of course, has led to now uh, basically a virtual tsunami of patients with heart failure. Anywhere estimates range between five to seven million individuals in the United States uh, with the diagnosis of heart failure. And this, of course, leads to expenditures that are estimated by 2030 to be over 800 billion U.S. dollars. So if you're a research scientist, it's a, it's a front and center topic uh, that uh, folks are willing to invest in. And also if you're a physician, it's something that you're seeing every day on the front lines in terms of taking care of these patients with heart disease. So a little bit of background on the physiology of the failing heart. So irrespective of the underlying cause of injury, whether it's an infarct, hypertension, primary cardiomyocyte failure leading to heart failure, or valve dysfunction, any decline in left ventricular performance leads to an activation of a number of signaling cascades in the body, and more specifically, neurohormonal activation uh, that causes a number of effects, both systemically as well as on the heart itself. And so these activation of these pathways will lead to vasoconstriction of the systemic vasculature and a decline in cardiac output due to an increase in afterload. And then the direct effects on the heart are things that we call maladaptive hypertrophy, uh, cardiac fibrosis in the heart, and then disrupted angiogenesis or myocardial capillarity becomes uh, significantly decreased in the failing heart. These, of course, lead to morbidity and mortality. And this vicious cycle of remodeling and progressively worsening 
ventricular function uh, continues on for some time until patients start to have a significant decline. And I think it's important to highlight here that these neurohormonal cascades that are activated impact both ventricles at the same time. And we often focus on the LV, but we'll talk a little bit about the RV today. So when we think about this as clinicians, what we see are patients who come in with an initial presentation, the decline in physical function, again, whether it's due to that heart attack, whether it's due to heart failure or long-standing hypertension, they come in with their initial presentation, they're treated medically, and then for a period of days, weeks, months, or years, these patients do fairly well. They adapt to that, um, to that injury event that, uh, that started them off on this cascade of heart failure. And then after a period of time, there are undulations of readmissions to the hospital where these patients are now coming back to the hospital with a decline in cardiac function, again, and we call this recurrent heart failure due to acute heart failure syndromes. And then ultimately, as time passes with compounding injury to the heart, there's a decline again in cardiac function to the point that patients are no longer able to support um, life at that point. And when we think about this process, so well, let's say a patient comes in with a heart attack, this heart is actually a normal heart that just underwent an injury, which would be the infarct. And this heart looks very different structurally than this heart. So at the other end of the spectrum, after many uh, weeks, months, or years have passed, that heart can dilate out and there's global remodeling through all those path pathways that we just talked about. And so whether you're at this end or this end, your heart will look very different. And that, of course, is what we deal with clinically all the time. But one of the most important take-home messages is that pressure and volume govern cardiac function. And this really boils down to the law of Laplace. And so a primary target of heart failure therapy is to try to reduce left ventricular wall stress. And so if this is a normal heart, when you have an acute injury, then you develop that compensatory hypertrophy that we talked about. Ultimately, that starts to fail, and you develop a reduction in cardiac function, and then you develop a dilated cardiomyopathy. You can see the radius here is increasing. And as a result, you can see that the volume in this chamber will also increase. So if we look at the law of Laplace, pressure and radius, that product translates clinically into pressure and volume. And the product of pressure and volume is wall stress. And one of the best ways to represent this is to look at the pressure volume loop. And so as I said, there are a number of talks that will go over the basics of the pressure volume loop. But each loop represents one cardiac cycle with diastolic filling, isovolumic contraction, ejection, and then isovolumic relaxation. And I'm going to highlight a few aspects here that I call plumbing 101 or some of the main take-home points when you look at the pressure volume loop. And the first one is to look at arterial elastance. And so arterial elastance is designed to represent a component of afterload. And if afterload, we believe, is wall stress, then arterial elastance is an important target of therapy or something that we should be looking at. And a simplified formula for arterial elastance is end systolic pressure divided by stroke volume, and it's the slope of this line here. The other line is the slope of end systolic elastance, which is contractile function. And if we look at afterload, the true definition of afterload is the amount of stress that the heart is dealing with throughout the phase of ejection. So it's not really just this one point. It's really throughout this, pa this um, entire phase of ejection. And that is equal to wall stress, which then is shown here by this formula, pressure times radius. So it's important to note that wall stress is not the same thing as arterial elastance, and that mean arterial pressure is not a sufficient surrogate for afterload or wall stress. And I try to represent wall stress here by these boxes, and you'll be seeing a number of boxes throughout the talk uh, showing the amount of uh, wall stress that the ventricle is dealing with by simply looking at the product of peak pressure and peak volume. The other uh, principle that I'll ask you to just focus on is this idea of ventricular arterial coupling. So normally, the coupling ratio between end systolic elastance and arterial elastance should be about 1. So this ratio here should equal 1, and that would be a marker of ventricular efficiency. And when we try to think about this clinically, you know, as we're, when we're taught in medical school about how to think about heart failure, heart function, we think about the Frank Starling curves. And each of these curves represents a different level of contractile function. And when you translate the Frank Starling curve into pressure volume loops, it really translates into a declining slope of end systolic elastance. Here, for example, a normal heart, then after an acute injury with a declining contractile function, this is now more of a compensated heart failure uh, model. And then here is cardiogenic shock with a significant decline in that slope of elastance. And that VA coupling becomes really important when you start to think about declining cardiac function. 
So normally the ratio should be about one. But what happens in the heart, in the failing heart, is that there's a significant upregulation of arterial elastins driven by that systemic vasoconstriction from, from neurohormones and a reduction in contractile function. So as a result, this ratio starts to change substantially with increasing afterload or a marker of afterload elastins, arterial elastins, and a reduction in contractile function. And a goal of therapy is to always try to modulate or get this VA coupling to recouple by reducing volume or reducing pressure, reducing afterload, um, or by increasing inotropy, increasing the slope back up towards normal. So the clinical tools that we have in hand to evaluate hemodynamic status are limited to the pulmonary artery catheter, which is put in through a venous access to measure pulmonary pressures. And then I use a fairly commonly a, a catheter known as the Langston catheter, which is a two-port or double uh, lumen pigtail catheter, which allows me to measure ventricular pressure and central aortic pressure simultaneously. And these are great for evaluating values in the pressure time domain, but they only provide an estimate of stroke volume, and so you don't get volumetric data um, from, these, uh, from these techniques. And then on the flip side, the other ways to try to evaluate hemodynamic status or volume is to use imaging, so 3D echocardiography, cardiac MRI, and these are great as non-invasive measures of LV and RV volume, uh, but they only provide a surrogate measure of cardiac pressure, so you don't have both simultaneously. And so that's why we actually look towards the conductance catheter method, especially as a research tool, but now more recently as a clinical tool. And the conductance catheter method basically is focused on the use of a pigtail with a number of electrodes that create an electrical field. And across these fields, you can measure segments of volume um, between each of these, between these poles. So there's a solid state transducer. Change in volume is measured across the electrode pair, pair, pairs. And you can also see total and segmental changes in volume. And this is shown here. So this is a screenshot um, I'll play for you of looking at segmental volumes. So this is in a patient that we did recently, looking at a, um, each of the segments of volumetric measures. And you can actually get segmental pressure volume loops within the pressure volume loop. These then get summed to create the total pressure volume loop here at the bottom. Now, the other way we think about uh, cardiac physiology in terms of, um, from a clinical perspective, is to look at the Wiggers diagram, which integrates pressure and volume simultaneously. And as a medical student, this was all very theoretical to me. But now, with the cat conductance catheter in hand, we can actually see the Wiggers diagram in real time. So up here, you're seeing changes in volume. And here, you're seeing the pressure transducer measuring in the LV. So systole and diastole, the changes in volume represented on top. And so when we combine all of those, what you're looking at here is a screenshot from the Inca device of volume, pressure, changes in DPDT, and then the ECG here. And this gets integrated to form the pressure volume loop in real time with a number of indices displayed on the screen. Now, you can also use the method to evaluate systolic and diastolic function. So this is a preclinical IVC occlusion study, basically looking at that slope of end systolic pressure volume, as well as end diastolic pressure volume relationships. You can also then look at load independent variables, such as preload recruitable stroke work, Starling contractility index, and end systolic pressure volume relationships there. And then also what we've been more interested in lately is looking at biventricular interdependence. So these are two conductance catheters in, in a preclinical model to give me the LV and the RV loop simultaneously. And this is shown here in terms of what we were doing with our model. And then here is when we do hypertonic saline volume, volumetric calibration of the catheters themselves. So these are all the variables. And I'll leave this up for folks to look at after the webinar that you can acquire from a conductance catheter study. These are all the preclinical applications that I think folks are quite familiar with, especially in terms of rodent physiology, looking at um, phenotyping genetic models, evaluating cardiac remodeling, ischemia, reperfusion injury, et cetera. And so when we look at our applications, we've been doing a number of uh, studies involving mice. The, one of the most canonical models of left heart failure in mice is the thoracic aortic constriction model. Um, that folks uh, who do this type of research are quite familiar with. And this is a great way to dissect the functional role of specific ligands and receptors. Our basic science laboratory focuses on the TGF-beta signaling pathway. And in particular, we're interested in a protein called endoglin. So we published this paper, paper back in 2012 looking at endoglin-deficient mice. And when we found when we put them under that TAC condition of left heart failure, the wild-type mice were dying, but the endoglin-deficient mice were actually having very good survival despite weeks of severe pressure overload to the ventricle. 
And so here we did an echocardiogram basically looking at the mice over time. The wild type mouse, by the time they got to 10 weeks, that law of Laplace was becoming a major factor because the left ventricle had dilated with minimal contractile function. But the endoglin deficient mice had normal contractile function, nice hypertrophy. And the hemodynamics here correlated very nicely with the echocardiogram, showing an increase in volume in the wild type, but not in the endoglin deficient mice. And then you can see this is the typical PV loop configuration of uh, thoracic aortic constriction with high pressures at the LDS to push up against. And the endoglin deficient mice were able to generate more pressure more peak pressure uh, because of that preserved cardiac function. But it becomes interesting when you start to look at these and with these mice. And so this was another model we looked at with a global deletion of, the, of another receptor. And what we found was that there was a significant decline in survival uh, with these mice compared to controls. And when we look at the echocardiogram, you would say that this is a model of systolic heart failure. And the question is whether or not this is true maladaptive remodeling. And it wasn't until we actually looked closer at the mouse that we saw that this mice was developing a significant arteriovenous malformation throughout the body and was having GI bleeding and anemia. This was uh, originally uh, characterized by Paul O, uh, who developed this mouse model. And from a cardiac perspective, what was interesting was that when we put the pressure volume uh, catheter in place, we found that arterial elastance was significantly reduced in these mice and that they actually had um, fairly preserved stroke volume a higher cardiac output, but a reduced contractile function. And so as a result, we had identified a model of high output heart failure, even though by the echocardiogram, you would have said this is a systolic failure, and you would, may have stopped there. But the pressure volume would really helped us interpret um, our, conclusion, our data, as well as uh, come up with better conclusions. So what about the right ventricle? We know clinically that the right ventricle always worsens, worsens mortality when it starts to fail. And this is whether you have left heart failure, whether you have pulmonary hypertension, it's a major area of research uh, coming up uh, um, through the ranks. And when we think about the LV and the RV from a pressure volume perspective, these really are a hemodynamic odd couple. The left ventricle is a very meaty, square-looking uh, type pressure volume loop with thick ventricles. And the right ventricle is much more sinewy. It's thin, it's highly compliant, and it's very sensitive to perturbations in loading conditions. And you can see this here represented by this classic slide showing that any increase in afterload on the right ventricle will cause a significant decline in stroke volume, where the same increase in afterload on the left ventricle won't have that effect. So we decided to look at this in uh, our mirroring models. We created a mirroring model of pulmonary artery constriction, where now you're seeing the left ventricle here is small, and the right ventricle is dilated as we create this model of RV pressure overload to the PA constriction. And so we looked at both these models of TAC and PAC, uh, and try to identify whether or not we can understand the physiology of biventricular dysfunction. And one of the most important steps forward for us was the ability to do biventricular catheterization in mouse models. And what this involved was putting in a small Millar PV loop catheter, conductance catheter, in through the um, external jugular vein into the RV, so going from right atrium to right ventricle, and then another Millar catheter into the LV, going from the aorta into the left ventricle. And we could do these simultaneously and look very specifically at what happens to biventricular interactions. And I want to highlight here that this certainly takes a lot of technical skill, and uh, Mark Aronovitz is our mouse surgeon uh, who really has developed this technique, um, and it's based on his expertise in terms of doing that. And so what you can see here, at baseline conditions, this is the right ventricle here shown in blue, and then the left ventricle shown in blue under sham or, or steady state conditions. And when we create that PA constriction, all of a sudden the ventricles are uncoupled. The right ventricle starts to dilate out, as you saw in that echo, and the left ventricle really gets smaller. And when we do the opposite with the left heart failure model, we saw that after weeks of left heart failure, the right ventricle also started to dilate out and remodel, as well as the left ventricle, as you would expect, with aortic constriction. So this was a nice insight, a look into biventricular coupling and uncoupling due to RV pressure overload um, in this model of PAC as well as TAC. And this allowed us to ask more questions, so we started looking at whether or not the VA coupling ratios are different in the RV versus the LV. Can we come up with new formulas like the biventricular coupling index? Uh, but what's really nice about the techniques is that you can really start to ask questions that you might not have been able to otherwise ask um, if you didn't have the technology to do that. So we've talked a little bit about the background of heart disease, preclinical uh, applications, and experimental biology. And now we'll talk about some translational applications 
uh, as it relates to heart failure and pump physiology. So as I mentioned earlier, heart failure is becoming a major problem in the United States. Out of 300 million people in the United States, about 2.6 percent uh, currently have a diagnosis of heart failure. And heart failure can be broken down into systolic failure, where the contractile apparatus is abnormal, or non-systolic heart failure, where we have preserved ejection fraction, uh, really due to diastolic dysfunction. And of these patients uh, who have uh, heart failure, systolic heart failure, a number of them are in an advanced deconditioned state where they have severe symptoms even at rest um, and are declining function pretty rapidly. And the number of patients under the age of 75 who have this advanced heart failure condition is also growing in number. And the treatment options for them include transplant or implantation of a surgical left ventricular assist device. And so the number of circulatory mechanical support options for these patients is growing rapidly. And you can see here the explosion of technology in terms of surgical left ventricular assist devices. Percutaneous mechanical support devices are also growing in number as well as variety. And then there are also a number of next generation devices coming down the pike. But one of the questions that we've been asking in, um, in terms of working with these technologies is how do they work? And as we talked about, everything centers in heart failure on the law of Laplace and all boils down to pressure and volume. And especially when you put a pump into the circuit, you're really now affecting pressure and volume very rapidly. And that can be difficult to measure if you don't have um, a technology that can measure pressure and volume simultaneously. So this is a picture of our large animal facility. We currently in the uh, facility have the Sigma uh, uh, platform, which gives us biventricular pressure uh, volume measurements using uh, CD LACOM catheters. And so here is what a heart looks like to a clinician that's um, basically had a patient put on a ventricular assist device. So here's the main pumping chamber. Blood comes in through the device, and then it gets ejected back out into the systemic aorta, uh, the systemic vasculature through the aorta. And when we look at the pressure volume loops that have been published historically with these devices, you can see here this is the uh, loop with no assist, and then this is the loop with assist. And what you're seeing here is when we look at those boxes of afterload or wall stress, is a significant reduction in pressure and volume, leading to a reduction in total LV wall stress. So in our laboratory, using the uh, pressure volume catheters, we've been looking at novel device development. So this is using an LV apical cannulation uh, in a um, bovine model, where we're looking at different RPM settings of a centrifugal pump uh, put in through the LV apex. And what you can see here is that these are actually real-time images. So I, when I look at these images, I try not to use the select loop mode because I'd rather see them very cleanly and show me the relationships of end systolic pressure as well as end diastolic pressure uh, with activation of these pumps. And you can see that fairly clearly here. So we've also been playing around with next generation devices. This is the hardware MVAD device that we used uh, preclinically um, and presented a couple of years ago in terms of looking at this in a uh, bovine as well as swine model. Here what we're looking at is activation of the MVAD device at different speeds. So if you modulate the speed of the device, you'll see that there's undulations in terms of the amount of unloading. And so the pressure, for example, will decline at higher speeds and will reduce, or sorry, will decline and then will come back up as you lower the speed. And this is shown here as well. So this is the pressure volume loop with the low speed setting then at the high speed setting. And when we put in the Langston catheter, again, looking at it from a clinical perspective, what we're seeing here is that the relationship between aortic pressure and LV pressure with the pump on at full speed shows a gradient between the LV and the AO. But when you reduce the speed, now all of a sudden the LV is matching the AO peak pressure, and you're starting to see the aortic valve open. So this is the effect of speed modulation through these devices on aortic valve function, as represented in the pressure time domain, but also confirmed here in the pressure volume domain. So other percutaneous pumps are also um, out there, and we've been studying them fairly intensively in the lab. This is the intra-aortic balloon pump, which is a volume displacement pump that inflates during diastole and deflates during systole to augment cardiac output or stroke volume. From a clinical perspective, this is what we see in the cath lab when we activate a balloon pump is a reduction in systolic pressure if the balloon pump is functioning properly. And then because it's inflating di during diastole, central aortic diastolic pressure goes up. And as a result, you get enhanced coronary perfusion here with ventricular unloading. And so in the pressure volume domain, this is a representation of what a volume displacement pump might do. And again, we're looking at arterial elastance as a measure of that uh, afterload and wall stress. 
And you can see here that there's a reduction in arterial elastins because you've dropped LD systolic pressure and increased stroke volume, as shown here. Now, the amount of wall stress reduction varies, and it really depends on the magnitude of the reduction in pressure and volume. And this is one of the uh, theoretical representations of how a balloon pump functions. And uh, Jan Schroeder did an elegant study in a surgical model. Uh, these are patients who are undergoing cardiac uh, surgery with an open chest, looking at the effect of the pressure volume loop at baseline, and then activation of the balloon pump uh, shown here. And so other different pumps are also out there. And when we use these pumps clinically, one of the questions I started asking when I started implanting these pumps was, how do they work? And uh, what we were getting back from the companies was all sorts of information, but nobody had really figured out what the pressure volume loop relationship looked like on pump and off pump. Um, and we wanted to study this more intensively because it affects how we deal with our patients and what devices we use, et cetera. So this is a uh, tandem heart pump. This is a centrifugal pump that sits outside the body. And it has a cannula that goes into the heart through the venous system, punctures through the right atrium into the left atrium. So it takes blood out of the left atrium to the pump and then pumps it back into the systemic arterial circulation in retrograde fashion. And one of the questions was, what is the impact of this pump configuration on loading condition? And so this is a picture of the pressure volume loop in a swine model where we activated this pump. And what you'll see here is end, end uh, diastolic volume and, and peak systolic pressure here. With activation of the pump, we're able to see a very nice effect on a reduction in end diastolic volume, a narrowing of the width of the loop with native stroke volume going down, and then uh, really no significant change, but a slight reduction in that end systolic pressure. And one of the debates in this, uh, in this arena uh, was whether or not these devices are increasing afterload. And if you were to look at this device in terms of how it works, and you look just simply at arterial elastins, you could see that the slope might go up. And so here's a, here's a um, cartoon figure of these pressure volume loops with activation of this pump. And so if you look just solely at arterial elastins, what you'd see is that this slope at baseline is shown here, but then with activation of the pump, because stroke volume went down, all of a sudden you're seeing a very steep slope of arterial elastins. But to our mind, that didn't quite compute with afterload itself. And what we're seeing here is that if you want to look at true afterload, you have to look at that box representation. So a reduction in pressure and a reduction in volume, a really significant reduction in wall stress on the left ventricle, which is our primary target of therapy for these patients with heart failure. So the next device that we were looking at is shown here, and this is the Impella device. The Impella device is a axial flow catheter that basically takes blood directly from the left ventricle and puts it into the aorta, shown here. And this was the hemodynamic effect of the Impella axial flow catheter, baseline pressure volume loop, and then basically a nice reduction in pressure, nice reduction in uh, volume as well. And what we saw that was interesting here was we saw a different triangular type configuration to the uh, left ventricle. And what this told us is that we had just lost our isovolumic phases of contraction and relaxation essentially telling us that the compliance or the, um, the chamber of the left ventricle had really become very compliant, almost like a right ventricle, uh, when you've got this pump taking all the volume out of the pump itself. And that's shown here as the pressure volume loop essentially melts away. And this really did impact, again, how we think about these pumps and how they work and how they work in our patients. So this is shown here again uh, figuratively, and we're looking again at those boxes of wall stress uh, reduction with the impella axial flow catheter. We then wanted to compare this. So this is a bovine model where we actually put in both the LA uh, cannula into the left atrium and then also put in the Impella device and try to do a head-to-head -head comparison, which is really hard to do. It's, it's very rare that you see comparative um, studies comparing one approach versus the other in the same model. And so here's the Impella catheter in the left ventricle. Here's that left atrial cannula. This is the pressure volume uh, catheter, so our conductance catheter is in line here in the LV, and then a pulmonary artery catheter or other measurements there as well. That's that conductance catheter sitting there. And so here we could create some really nice uh, pressure volume loops. Again, uh, not deleting any of the beats, non-selected beats, basically looking at that end systolic pressure volume relationship and the end diastolic pressure volume relationship. Looking here at the Impella device versus the tandem device. And this really helped us understand the physiology. Very nice isovolumic contraction relaxation bars. And then this one, if you let it keep going, it'll turn into a triangle over time.
The other pump that we've started to look at is venoarterial ECMO. So this, di this device takes blood from the venous system, takes it through an oxygenator and a centrifugal pump, and then it puts it back into the system or systemic arterial circulation. And one of the questions is, what is the effect of venoarterial ECMO on loading conditions in the heart? So here in a swine model, again, we activated VA ECMO. And what we saw was a very different configuration, increasing end systolic pressure points, narrowing of native stroke volume, but no significant change in end diastolic volume with VA ECMO. And again, this is, uh, was unknown to us until we started to do the studies with the PV loop catheter to understand the difference between this device versus the Impala versus the tandem heart devices that we just talked about. So this is shown here figuratively, an increase in end systolic pressure and a reduction in stroke volume, again, leading to that increase in arterial elastins, but more importantly, leading to an increase in our loading conditions for wall stress uh, with the venoarterial ECMO pump. And of course, we wanted to confirm this clinically, so using that double lumen Langston catheter, what we're showing here is the LV tracing here in uh, yellow and the aortic tracing here in purple. And with activation of VA ECMO, what you can see here is a significant increase in LV systolic pressure driven by that amount of load put onto the ventricle by uh, taking blood from the venous system and pressurizing the arterial circulation. So this confirmed what we were seeing with the conductance catheter preclinically, and now we were seeing it clinically. So when we look at the distinct effects of these pumps, we're looking at percent change in wall stress with VA ECMO versus tandem heart and the Impella devices. And this, of course, has changed how I operate uh, as an interventional cardiologist. So this was a patient who came in with a significant left heart failure, biventricular failure, and cardiogenic shock. These are the pulmonary artery catheter tracings, the systemic arterial tracings. We activate VA ECMO, and you see that immediate jump up in the arterial tracing here. But within 10 minutes, what I was seeing is that my pulmonary artery pressure had jumped up significantly. And actually, in this patient, had become equal to my systemic pressures. And this is really a critical condition that we needed to confirm that this was real and not just an artifact. So I put in the length in catheter, measuring my LV pressure and the arterial pressure simultaneously, showing that there basically was no gradient between the LV and the AO. And the LV was now being distended under high pressure in this particular patient with VA ECMO. So then we added a device, the Impella device, to unload the ventricle with this patient who had the ECMO system in. And this is shown here on the echocardiogram you can see the ventricle here. This is the Impella catheter, and this patient's on ECMO with the, L, with the Impella device acting as a vent mechanism to release pressure off the ventricle. When I take the Impella out, you can see here that the LV has dilated out a bit more if you just put them on ECMO alone. So again, hemodynamic uh, data driving how we're thinking clinically and when we're operating. So this was the pressure volume loop rationale for venting with a reduction in systolic pressure and volume. Once you put in that additional device um, or use a different mechanism, there's a number of mechanisms for venting with ECMO uh, that we won't get into. But that gets us back down to that reduction in wall stress, which is our primary targeted therapy for a lot of these patients. And this has led to and translated to how we think about things in terms of clinical decision making. This is a consensus statement that just came out this week um, from a number of interventional heart failure, um, cardiology, as well as surgical bodies and you'll see that one of the figures in this uh, consensus statement represents pressure volume loops. And it's data that I think is really important, and it highlights the fact that understanding pressure volume relationships can drive clinical decision making and um, uh, how we operate and how we think uh, clinically. This is another model that I wanted to highlight. This is a patient, actually, who came in with a heart attack. And this is what a heart attack looks like to an interventional cardiologist. I'm looking here specifically at the left circumflex artery, and what we're seeing is that there's a thrombotic subtotal occlusion of the left circumflex. This patient has multivessel disease. There's disease in the LAD or left anterior descending artery, and a very small non-dominant right coronary artery with filling of the left anterior descending artery apex. And when you have a heart attack, time is muscle. What this boils down to is you want to open the artery as quickly as possible to restore oxygen supply. That's the current treatment paradigm. And when we have been studying ischemia reperfusion injury models in the translational lab, we actually were very surprised to see that during LED occlusion, or occlusion of the left uh, anterior descending artery, we were seeing that actually hemodynamically the animal was doing okay, but the ventricle was beginning to dilate out. And then once we reperfused the artery, 
we saw that there was a significant shift. There was a dilation uh, of the LV itself. There's a reduction in the contractile slope, so contractility got worse. And again, the amount of stroke work that the heart was doing was reduced, mostly because of damage. And this is a pressure volume loop representation of ischemia reperfusion injury, which I hadn't seen before until we started studying this in our translational laboratory. And so one of the questions we thought was, well, our hypothesis was, well, what about not targeting myocardial oxygen supply, but if a lot of these devices I just showed you reduce wall stress, and wall stress equates with myocardial oxygen demand or consumption, then perhaps the thing to do would be to first reduce myocardial oxygen demand and then open the artery when it's safe to do so. So in partnership with Cardiac Assist, we created a study where we put in a conductance catheter and then put in the tandem device, this is a left atrial cannula, and then created an occlusion to mimic a heart attack. And this is the swine model using um, uh, a 3D echo system to look at what happens to the ventricle when we activate the pump. And you can see a nice unloading effect on the left ventricle here in a closed chest model of mechanical unloading. I think that's really important that you can do this all percutaneously without the need for opening the chest to put in the conductance catheters. It can all be done through interventional techniques. And what we found in this study was that unlike the control group where reperfusion injury brought us all the way out here, with unloading, we actually were all the way over here. So a nice reduction in that box of, you imagine that box of wall stress here compared to all the way out here, okay, highlighting that fact of first unloading the ventricle and then opening the artery. In this study, we also used that 3D echocardiography and strain imaging to start to begin to dissect whether or not 3D imaging and strain actually correlates with a pressure volume loop index. So here you're looking at circumferential strain and its correlation with LV stroke work measured by the catheter. And I think this was a, a nice insight into whether or not, whether or not these strain imaging uh, variables uh, actually correlate with human dynamics. So what we found in this study, though, was that if you had the unloading approach, there's a significant reduction in your infarct size compared to if you just had the artery open without an unloading device in place, and that this actually correlated with the amount of stroke work that your heart was doing. So the idea was maybe if you first unload the heart, then open the artery, you could reduce infarct size. We've since now looked at this with the Impella device from Abiumed, and have put in this uh, model again in the, in the large animal lab with the conductance catheter in place right in line next to the Impella device. This is the group that got primary reperfusion, and then this is the group that had the unloading device put in first, and then were reperfused. And you can see a nice reduction in peak LV wall stress with the unloading device in place compared to the control group. And what we found again was that the mechanical unloading reduced infarct size compared to primary reperfusion, and that there's a very nice linear regression between infarct size and LV wall stress, again suggesting that primary unloading might be a good approach to myocardial protection and recovery uh, and when we think about uh, dealing with um, these patients. And so that actually did drive how we think clinically. And so in this particular patient that you saw where the uh, left circumflex artery was subtotally occluded, the patient was in cardiogenic shock. They were hemodynamically unstable. And so in that particular patient, we implanted an Impella device first, and then we went ahead and looked at the artery. This was before reperfusion, with the, and then this is after with the Impella device in place and after treatment. And you can see comparing this degree of reperfusion versus this degree with an unloading device in place. And the idea is potentially we can drive a new clinical paradigm, a new age for invasive hemodynamics. Uh, and the idea of using conductance catheters in clinical practice is certainly appealing for many reasons. Um, and it's something that I'm hoping that will uh, grow over time. These are some sc screenshots that were sent to me about integrating pressure volume loop analysis into uh, the typical screens that we see in the cardiac catheterization laboratory as well as the electrophysiology laboratory. And then the clinical device that we use is known as the INCA device uh, made by CD LACOM uh, for our clinical pressure volume loops. So I'm going to show you how we uh, have been approaching this in our clinical practice in terms of doing clinical research. Uh, this is the INCA system and it's a platform if you don't integrate it into your screens, you can uh, basically slide this in and out of the catheterization laboratories or operating rooms pretty easily. This is the conductance catheter on the sterile field uh, as it comes out in its, uh, in its packaging. And basically, um, once we have it out, we go ahead and start to calibrate uh, the conductance catheter as shown here. So the saline calibration allows us to make sure that uh, 
the catheter is functioning properly and that we get uh, optimal, uh, image, uh, optimal imaging of the pressure volume loop. What I do is I load a uh, O25 uh, its wire through the uh, pigtail of the conductance catheter itself, make sure it's coming out the back end. And so we've got a wire-loaded pigtail that goes into a vascular sheath in the patient. This is the picture of the wire ahead of the pigtail catheter as it comes up the um, descending aorta and it starts to, we'll bring it around the arch here. So here is the conductance catheter and the wire in front. And what you'll see is we'll put the wire first into the left ventricle and then we advance the conductance catheter into the left ventricle um, as shown here across the aortic valve. And then this is catheter positioning, trying to get along the long axis of the left ventricle. Um, there's our PA catheter in place and then we're looking at a balloon pump here in the background um, with the conductance catheter in position. So I think there's been a lot of very interesting data out there. I encourage folks to look at the clinical papers um, looking at the utility of pressure volume loops in a number of clinical environments. I'm going to just highlight a few of them here as we close. The first one is looking at pressure volume loops in patients who have aortic stenosis undergoing transcatheter aortic valve replacement. So this is a percutaneous technique where the aortic valve can be dilated, a stenotic or tight aortic valve can be dilated with a balloon, and then a valve can be deployed across the aortic valve, thereby rendering it essentially normal again because the stent itself here contains a uh, normally functioning aortic valve. And what you can see here, these are some uh, slides that were sent from Bern, uh, basically looking at the pressure volume loop. And again, we're looking at that slope of arterial elastance uh, to measure afterload. This is the stroke work of the ventricle when the valve is stenotic, so before the valve therapy. And then after the valve therapy, what you see is a significant reduction in the load on the ventricle. That end systolic pressure point comes down. The slope of arterial elastance is reduced. You can imagine those boxes of wall stress would be reduced as well and the total stroke work of the ventricle is immediately reduced. So a nice example of pressure volume loops identifying the hemodynamic impact of an acute therapy in real time uh, in the patient. And then another area that's of particular interest is uh, mitral valve regurgitation. So instead of pressure overload, this is a disease of volume overload where you can have a degenerative mitral valve that can basically have normal ventricular function but then can have a very leaky mitral valve causing uh, impairment in cardiac output. And then also you can have functional mitral regurgitation where the ventricle may be severely impaired in its function and the mitral valve is leaky because the LV is dilated and the uh, leaflets aren't able to coapt properly. And so the research that's been done in this area also looking at the effect of a percutaneous clip therapy for mitral regurgitation. Here's the clip brought in across the transeptal puncture into the left atrium and then deployment of the clip to bring together those leaflets of the mitral valve to try to close it so that there's no longer any regurgitation coming back into the left atrium and all of it's now going out into the left, uh, from the left ventricle to the aorta. So here is the pre mitral clip pressure volume loop, so a wide stroke volume uh, basically driven by uh, that low arterial elastance because you're now pumping into the left atrium as well as the aorta. But when you put the clip in place, and you're no longer pumping into the left atrium as well as the aorta, all of a sudden you've increased now the load on the ventricle. And you might think that's a bad thing, but actually this makes the ventricle much more efficient. And so if we were to look at VA coupling between EA and EES in this patient pre mitral clip versus post mitral clip, you'd see a much better coupling efficiency ratio um, once the clip is in place. And so that increase in elastance in this place, in this condition, is actually a good thing. Um, as you now will have stroke volume going out the aorta, towards the aorta instead of towards the left atrium. And this, I think, is a really terrific paper from Circulation 2013, comparing the effects of mitral clip therapy on functional mitral regurgitation versus degenerative mitral regurgitation. And here you can see some really gorgeous pressure volume loops in the degenerative group, where you can see the effect, again, of that increasing arterial elastance and uh, re resolution or restoration of ventricular efficiency with clip therapy in DMR. But in functional mitral regurgitation, it's much more complicated because remember, the ventricle is not pumping normally. So the ventricle is not used to these changes in afterload. And so as a result, you see a, a bit of a variety of effects of uh, mitral clip therapy on the pressure volume loop. And I think this really provides some important insights into clinical uh, decision making as well as application of the devices 
Of course, these are still being studied in the functional and mitral regurgitation population. But I think the pressure volume loops here, I highlight this point to indicate that as a clinician and as a scientist, I look at this, and it really does make me start to think about, the, about how the pumps, how these um, clips are working and what patients we'd be targeting uh, with these types of therapies. The other area that uh, I think is of great interest is the use of PV loops in the electrophysiology lab for desynchrony, which is now being treated with biventricular pacemakers, which have a lead in the right ventricle as well as a lead in the left ventricle. And the idea here is to try to resynchronize a, um, a, a desynchronous ventricle that's being driven by a conduction abnormality in the heart. And you can see here that using the pressure volume loops, the optimal pressure volume loop can be attained by changing the location of your pacing leads in the left ventricle as well as right ventricle to optimize clinical outcomes for these patients. So right now, I think there are a number of potential clinical applications for the conductance catheter method. Uh, it's important to note that the um, catheters are FDA approved for hemodynamic interrogation. Uh, we use them for clinical research, um, and I think that's a great starting point as we start to look at how these devices, how this device, the conductance catheter, may impact our decision making and, of course, uh, future device and drug development. So for diagnostic evaluation, it really boils down to ventricles, valves, and vessels. I think there's all sorts of applications for the conductance catheter when you're thinking about cardiac uh, hemodynamics. And then for therapeutic evaluation, we've shown you a few of them, but there are a lot of different ones out there in the literature looking at drug effects, cell-based therapies like stem cell therapy, uh, the effect of mechanical pumps, the resynchronization therapy, septal ablation for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has been published, and that also is an interesting area to look at for a subset of patients with heart failure. Valve disease, I think any valve therapy would benefit from an evaluation of uh, pressure volume loops in terms of the impact. We showed that with aortic versus mitral. And then, of course, vessels, pre and post coronary intervention um, under different conditions, like the ischemia reperfusion model we showed for patients with heart attack versus patients with end-stage heart failure due to coronary disease. So these are the locations in the United States that use uh, PV loop systems uh, for clinical applications or clinical research. Um, so I think it's important to note that you're not alone that these are, uh, that there are locations across the U.S., and I'm sure if you reached out to the company or to any of these sites uh, for further information, they could all probably provide you with their experience and give you feedback on the utility of the conductance catheter method. So in conclusion, pressure and volume govern cardiac physiology. The conductance catheter method provides a powerful platform for analysis of preclinical and clinical hemodynamics at different levels from bench to bedside. And I think it's a time for a fresh look at invasive hemodynamics. I think current hemodynamic clinical practice is restricted to the pressure time domain, and that is a very effective approach for many, many conditions. But when we start to look at novel devices and different approaches to patients, uh, I think the pressure volume loop comes into play, and that certainly has you know, opened our eyes here at Tufts Medical Center in terms of the physiology that we're dealing with with these patients. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, our teams. We have a lot of people who are involved, uh, both at the basic science level, the translational laboratory, in the surgical research laboratory, as well as in the cath lab itself, and then a number of industry sponsors and funding from uh, the NIH as well as AHA for a lot of the studies that I showed to you today. So with that, I'm going to stop, and thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kapoor. That was a great presentation. And now we, uh, we do still have a few minutes uh, to allow for a Q&A session. So I'm going to go ahead and, and take back the controls from you. Um, all right. So um, we, uh, and as well, I appreciate uh, our attendees, uh, you know, chiming in with a few questions as we progress throughout the, the webinar. And I am also going to bring uh, Tim Doherty on the line, who is the Director of Sales and Marketing at Millar. Can you hear us, Tim? Yes, hello, everyone. Great, thank you. All right, uh, so I'll, I'll move ahead with the first question, uh, and this came from the audience, and this does bring us back to the, uh, the preclinical area of, of your talk, Dr. Kapoor. Uh, the question is, how did you successfully perform biventricular PV loops in the mice uh, example that you brought up, and you know, could you elaborate on the procedure a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. So the, um, so the technique um, you know, was one that we were basically just playing around with, uh, with whether or not we can do it. And the first, first step was to just get the RV loop and see whether or not we were getting a good right ventricular pressure volume loop. Uh, 
we were able to do that pretty easily. And of course, the left ventricular loop we've been acquiring for some time. The idea of doing them simultaneously uh, required us to have two, uh, two consoles uh, for each conductance catheter. Uh, and then using two separate conductance catheters, uh, we were able to uh, test whether or not there would be an interruption of the electrical fields. That was one of our concerns, was that we might not be able to see them simultaneously uh, very effectively. At first, and I have to say that there was some variability. There were some models where we were able to do the simultaneous bi-V approach, get very nice PV loops simultaneously with no um, field disturbance at all. You can change the uh, frequency of the field, so you could, uh, that did help um, in some cases to try to give us a good look at the pressure volume loops. Ultimately, this has now become a standard approach for us um, to do biventricular pressure volume loops in our mouse PV loop studies. Um, and what we're doing now is we're doing it sequentially. So we'll do the uh, we'll do the RV loop or the LV loop first, acquire it, and then do the other um, and then activate the other catheter, uh, even though both are indwelling at the same time, to basically just get the loops um, you know in rapid succession right next to each other under the same steady state conditions. So that's another approach that can be done. We did publish that technique um, in PLOS One, and um, I think in there we sort of detail out the technical aspects of how to do it. And if you have any further questions, certainly feel free to reach out to me, and I can connect you with Mark Ronovitz and our team um, who have really perfected the technique. Great. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I'm sure the, uh, the audience uh, can definitely appreciate, as you were alluding to the surgical expertise required to, uh, to carry out such a uh, such a procedure. Um, all right, uh, so moving on, um, another question. Can you give any advice for a new PI or researcher tasked with implementing PV loops in a group with no real hemodynamic or surgical experience? Uh, just to help lower the learning curve and make for a smooth implementation, what would you suggest? Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, when you're, when you're quote-unquote tasked with that, uh, with that, um, with that need or that, in, that need for that information, I think the best thing to do is, is to partner and collaborate. Uh, you know, the best way to learn pressure volume loops is to, is to try to work with someone or at least communicate with someone who's been doing them for some time. Um, and, you know, you pick up so much when you start doing the pressure volume loops or observing uh, how they're being done. Uh, so I would suggest the first thing to do is identify experts in the field um, who you can connect with to discuss, uh, first of all, the utility and then the technical aspects of uh, the conductance catheter method uh, for preclinical -pre research. The next area of resource, of course, is the company. So the company is very good and very responsive. You know, th when we approached them with a biventricular loop um, approach, Millar was exceptionally responsive and very helpful in terms of just not only getting us the catheters, but also troubleshooting and figuring out what the next best step is. We had people on site who were um, able to help us uh, troubleshoot uh, the BIB approach. So I think there's a lot of help out there, and the best way to start would be with other uh, scientists who are doing pressure volume loops, and then, of course, connecting with the company and, um, and figuring out exactly what your setup is or what you need to get set up. Um, and sometimes, if you're not able to set it up in your own uh, laboratory, it's simply partnering with someone who can do the analysis for you uh, or do the technique for you and provide you with the data. And along the way, you'll learn hemodynamics um, you know, as you go. Great, yeah, and thank you very much. And and Tim, um, I have you back on the line. Uh, would you like to add anything to, to Dr. Kapoor's response? Yeah, I think, I mean, his point about collaborating is really is really key, and that's one thing we try to do is connect groups, you know, with groups that we know are experienced that have you know, been up and running for, for many years, and that's always, I think, a good first step for a new lab is to reach out. And again, you can reach out to Malar or, you know, other users that you might know in your area, and we're always happy to try to connect people with other experts in their, in their application. Great. Well, thank you. And all right, so one, we have time for one last question. So I'll, I, I will bring it back to, you know, to the, the clinical side of things. Um, so Dr. Kapoor, what do you see uh, as, a drive, as a greater driving uh, force towards the adoption of technology like PV loops in routine cardiology? And, and on the flip side of that, uh, what do you see as, as the main uh, force holding it back? Yeah, I think that's a great question, a very appropriate question. So I think the driving force for uh, implementation of the technology 
is the fact that heart failure has really become a, um, a dominant uh, problem, not only in the United States, but around the world. And that, that's, why, that's why we started with the images of the pandemic of heart disease. It's not going anywhere. And um, it is a significant burden on society. And so the more we can understand uh, heart failure hemodynamics, as you've seen through hopefully some of these illustrations, it drives what we do clinically. And it'll, it'll drive the next round of innovations in drug therapy as well as device therapy uh, for uh, patients with heart disease. So the driving force, I think, is the fact that heart disease is growing uh, and is a major problem and a burden on society. The limitations of holding it back, I think, are that you know, pressure volume loops are not necessarily intuitive. They require a lot of um, uh, at least focused understanding. These webinars, I think, are a great example of that. Uh, where I've even looked at webinars and had to really pause it, go back, listen to that again, make sure I understand it as much as possible. Um, so one is the didactics behind pressure and volume um, and making sure that that's taught not only in our, um, in our practices, but also back in medical school uh, as we start to think about how to train the next generation of physicians and scientists uh, in the domain of pressure and volume. Uh, the other thing that's holding it back, I think, is you know, the technology itself. There are some limitations of conductance catheter uh, technology and the method. Uh, there's a lot of questions about the ability to, of deploying the pigtails. As you saw, it's actually quite simple. Um, there are some tweaks that I think that can be made to the catheters that are not insurmountable by any means. Uh, volume calibration is a major issue, and I think a lot of people will bring that up. Um, about looking at volumetric calibration, how to do that in man. Uh, these ventricles come in all shapes and sizes. And so to really get good uh, reproducible volumetric data, we do a number of things uh, like trying to correlate the volumes we're measuring with the conductance catheter with uh, echocardiography, 3D echo in particular, as well as with MRI indices. Uh, there are some techniques including um, the hypertonic saline injections to look at volume displacement, et cetera. Um, so I think that's one thing that will need to be worked out is uh, how to optimize volume calibration with the catheters um, over time. So there are a few technical aspects that I think are, are very surmountable. They can be overcome. Uh, but the driving force, I think, is so overwhelming in terms of the need for advanced understanding of hemodynamics to optimize patient outcomes um, and to drive innovation in the field. Um, so that's how I would think about the yin and the yang of uh, conductance catheter method application. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that is definitely great insight. And Tim, uh, may I ask, do you have anything anything to add? Yeah, I think the, you know, the partnership between Millar and CD Lacom and with customers like Dr. Kapoor, you know, that's really what we want to drive towards is optimizing outcomes and you know, taking the technology from where it stands now and advancing it along with, with the focus on heart failure and uh, cardiovascular medicine in general. Definitely, definitely. All right. Well, um, as it has uh, run a little bit over time here, so I will I will wrap things up. But um, I definitely like to to thank our, our presenter, Dr. Kapoor, as well as uh, our our sponsors for today's event, uh, NB Millar, and thank you, Tim, as well personally. Uh, so yes, as well, thank you to our entire audience for, for joining on today on uh, Inside Scientific. And uh, just a reminder, we will follow up. Uh, as, I, as I said at the beginning, the, the webinar is recorded and also the slide deck. Uh, we had a few questions come in throughout the presentation whether or not the slide deck would be available, and it, and it will. Uh, so we'll follow up uh, via email, and it will be available on our website as well. But again, thank you, everyone, for joining us, and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.